Welcome to the latest edition of Tales of Blue, where I'm delighted to be joined by a player with over 450 professional games to his name. Um, just so happens to be the first one million pound English footballer, Steve Daly. How are you doing, Steve? I'm good, Matt. Thank you. How's yourself? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Appreciate your Thanks time. Thanks for inviting me, mate. Right, born in Barnsley into a footballing family, Steve, your dad being a regular at Coventry while your other pat was on the books at Sheffield Wednesday. Who were a young Steve Daly's football's idols? Team did you support growing up? Uh, there was a couple, of, you, you won't know them because I was a mad Barnsley fan at the time, Mark, and uh, there was a centre forward uh, called Tony Layton. And um, he, he just, made, he, he would go through a brick wall for anybody. He was a great professional. He was a good player as well. And there was a, a little winger called Eddie O'Hara. And uh, he, he was he was brilliant to me. He, he, looked, he, he was quick. He was sharp. He was he was good with the ball. He could use both feet. But then you know, looking at the the higher leagues at that time, um, ooh, Bobby Charlton, absolute absolute idol. Loved him. Loved him. A great player. And I actually got to meet him uh, in in quite sad circumstances at uh, Billy Wright's funeral, and. Uh, Another Wolves former player, Jeff Palmer, we were walking down to the Molyneux after the church service and uh, I went, I said, oh my God, Bobby Charlton's coming down here. And uh, he said, oh God. And then and I, I said, uh, he said hello. And I said, uh, hello, Mr. Charlton. And uh, he said, no, my name's Bobby. He says, my friends call me Bobby. And I, got, I, I like you as a friend, so you can call me Bobby. And I said, thanks very much, Bobby. Great. And that was it. Brilliant, brilliant. So when did you realise football was as a career was an option for you, Steve? Um, I was playing for, um, well, I was a young kid at school, obviously, and I, I got into the Barnsley junior side. Uh, and as, as the, the years went on in school, I got into the Barnsley boys side. And, um, and then my, my brother uh, said, come and play for our, our pub team on a Sunday morning. I was, I was 15, you know. Oh, wow. And... Uh, I was playing against blokes, blokes that were probably in their late twenties, early thirties, and I and I was going past them with the ball, you know, and and, and putting it in the back of the net, and uh, it um, it was quite nerve wracking because they were saying, "You try and do that again, mate, and I'll I'll take your legs off." Yeah. Anyway, and anyway, I, I, he, he he invited a, a, a wolf scout from Wolf Wanderers in Barnsley to watch me play for the pub team. And I had, a, I had an exceptional morning. I think we won about 11 or 12, and I got six that morning. The next day on the Monday, I was in Wolverhampton on a month's trial at 15. Did you, you had trials for Sheffield Wednesday and Barnsley. Um, after the progression of Wraith, Wraith Wanderers, they were called the team. The, what, what are your early memories of a young footballer joining Wolves, Steve? Uh, the first thing was leaving home, you know. Uh, I... My dad was a miner and um, my mum was a nurse and it, we, we hadn't got everything. You hadn't got a lot. So, and, and it was leaving, leaving Barnsley, really, leaving my mates um, and going down to Wolverhampton, originally on a month's trial. And uh, I, uh, that went into three months, Mark, you know. I don't think anybody knew I was there, you know. I, I think I was there to sleep, sweep the dressing rooms uh, and collect the kit of the first team. And I went down there. It ended up being three months. Uh, and the manager who had just been appointed was uh, Bill McGarry. And he called me at the office and he, he just said, listen, I've had, I've had good reports about you. Uh, I'd like you to sign. And um, that's I signed a, 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 an apprentice professional contract. And uh, after three months, I stayed there 10 years. Great stuff. So 73-74 season sees... Wolves feature with a full run to the League Cup final against City, but you didn't play that day, Steve. How? No, I um, I played Mark. I played the week before, funny enough, at Old Trafford against United, and we drew nil nil. And that after that Saturday game, we all got on the coach and uh, driving down to London because it was the Cup final the next week. Uh, Bill McGarry, the managers, come and sat with me and just said, "Listen, you've had a great game today, but." If Mike Bale is fit, I'm going to play him and you won't play. He said, I'm letting you know now so you know the situation. You're a young lad. You've got every chance of getting back to Wembley. Mick, 
he's coming to the, uh, the, the, end, the end of his career. Um, so if he's fit, he's going to play. And unfortunately for Mick, unfortunately for me, he was fit and, and I, I didn't play. What did you, was you part of the squad though? Did you go down with the squad? I, yeah, I travelled down to Wembley uh, and stayed with the lads and everything like that. And uh, I sat on the, I wasn't on the bench as a, as a substitute. I, I, I was there and sat on the bench next to Bill McGarry and uh, it, it was just a great victory. Great victory. So it's fair to say, Steve, you were fast becoming a much sought after player at Wolves. First showing interest in May 1978 with a reported bid. Were you close to joining City then, or was it just a case of carry on playing? Um, I, I, to be honest with you, Mark, I, I was, I, I was getting phone calls from I don't know if I should say this, from quite a lot of clubs, you know, uh, wanting to sign me. And I got a phone call uh, the one morning saying that um, Manchester City were very, very keen to sign me and they'd do whatever it took to sign me. Uh, and that was a that was a, a nice assurance, you know, um, that somebody wants you that badly. And if somebody wants you that bad and they're willing to pay the money and somebody wants to you to go, they're going to want the, the, the most money they can get for you, uh, which resulted in me going to City and Andy Gray going to Wolves. You, you finally arrive at May Road in September 1979, becoming the first ever million pound footballer. Um, I'll get on the ins and outs of that shortly, but how did it make you feel on a personal level at the time, Steve, knowing you would become a million pound footballer at the age of 26? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, yeah. I walked in the dressing room, I, I travelled up, had a medical, on the 5th of September it was, 1979, and uh, I'd been for a medical, agreed the contract, agreed the terms, and they were training, I think they played Sheffield Wednesday the night before in a, in a cup game, League Cup or FA Cup game at Main Road, and I'd gone for my medical on the next, the next day and uh, passed everything, agreed terms and signed my contract. And that afternoon, they had a training session. And it was just, it was the people like Big Joe and, and, and uh, Boothy, Willie Donachy, you know, and, and it, was, it was great. They were great with me. And I did you have an agent the... back then, Steve? Did you have an agent or did you have an agent? No, or I didn't. Yourself? No, I didn't. I didn't. I, I, looking back, maybe I should have done. I don't know. Um, but no, I, I, I just went up there. I agreed terms um, and everything was fine. I signed a contract. It, initially, it was a five year contract. And I said, well, is there any chance of getting a 10 year contract? And, um, and Tony Buck and Malcolm Allison said, yeah, if you want a 10 year contract, you've got a 10 year contract. Because they were going to give me a five year deal with a five year option. And um, I just said, could I have a straight 10? And they said, yeah. And, and that was that. But in, in looking back, if I, if I wasn't in the team, uh, Mark, and, and not getting a game, I, I just couldn't sit there and take the wages. That, that, that wasn't me, you know. I've always, I've always been brought up by my family. You, you, you only get what you get because you go and get it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, my, my dad always said, make your own way in life, mate. You know, so I'm assuming and, uh, your weekly wage improved, Steve, upon joining City. But what, what did the club ask of you when, when you signed? What, what was expected of you? Uh, well, I, we, I don't think we, we didn't really discuss that. I was I was just put into the team against uh, Southampton, um, but I think they'd sold a couple of players, and I didn't I didn't realise they were selling the players. I mean, they sold Gary Owen, who I said oh, I told you that I spoke to Gary last week. Um, they sold Gary, Barnsley, Acer, and uh, Mick Shannon. And four fantastic, four internationals, you know. So to, to replace them, Mark, is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, and it was a bit of an experimental uh, period at that time with, with new players coming in. They signed a lad from Stockport. Um, they signed Stepanovic. Kazi Dania was there. Kazi was brilliant. Um, we signed Dennis Stewart back again. Barry Silkman was there. Uh, but, you know, you, you sell four internationals. I, I, was, I was right on the verge of the England team at that time. And I thought that the move to Manchester would earn me that international cap, you know, the full international cap. And um, we, when I was playing for the England B side, we'd just come back from a, a tour of the Far East. And the manager, was, uh, manager of the England side was Ron Greenwood. The manager of our, our England B side was Bobby Robson. 
and um, we got back to Heathrow Airport and uh, Ron Greenwood said, the gaffer says you've had a great, uh, a great tournament uh, and I'm going to bring you into the international squad next season. And I signed for Manchester and uh, I never got another phone call, never got another, look, another call up, which was, uh, which was dis- disappointing but understandable with the, the, the way things went, you know. Yeah. Your debut comes against Southampton. Did your yeah. debut um, on the eighth of September, seventy-nine, a one-nil home defeat. What are the memories of that game and your performance, Steve? Um, yeah, it. Uh, funnily enough, I made my debut for Wolves against Southampton in nineteen seventy-one, seventy-two. We beat them four-two. I made the fourth and I scored the third. Uh, but it was a totally and I, I, I took some some confidence from from doing that against Southampton at Molyneux. Uh, hoping that it would repeat itself, but uh, I can't remember who scored for Southampton, and it wasn't it wasn't the greatest of starts, Mark. You know, I wanted to to sort of not all guns blazing, but put in a good performance and um, and hopefully come out with the points. You know, and uh, but unfortunately that day it well, it, um, it didn't happen. So I'm sure you've been asked this a million times. But did you feel the pressure of that price tag from the start? Was it something that bothered you? Um, I think people made more of it than I did, you know. Um, it, it it did start to get to me in the end that the the um, the abuse I was I was taking, and um, but the, the 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 one section of the main road crowd, which were absolutely fantastic to me, uh, and I'll never forget it, um, was the Kipax. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, you know, every every time I, I, I played, they were they were there behind me singing my name and all that sort of stuff, you know. And uh, they they were fantastic. But I was I was taking quite a bit of abuse, and uh, I think probably the thought taking me out of the firing line and leaving me on the bench or leaving me out of the squad would would benefit me uh, in the long term. But uh, it, it it just seemed to get worse, you know. The harder I tried, the worse it became. Um, and and that that pressure gets to you. Maybe it was a a, a culmination of, of the fee and um, some of the crowds, some of the, the chanting the crowd was giving me and the abuse that I was taking. And it, it was, you know, you, my family were hearing it, um, reading the papers and reading what people were saying about me. Um, and it, yeah, it, it does. It does get to you. It does get to you. I mean, there's no, there isn't a day goes by, Mark, and I, I'm honest with you now, that there isn't a day goes by when I don't think about what happened at Manchester. If, if I, if, I sometimes say to myself, "Do you think you'd have been better staying there and battling it, and, and fighting it, and, and you'd have come out on top?" Uh, I don't know. But I wasn't getting the games, and like I said earlier, I'm I'm, I'm not the guy that's just going to stay there for the money and pick my money up and say, if you don't want to play me, I'll just get my wages. I, I, I wanted to play. Yeah, but it's um, fair to say it was a difficult period at Main Road that you we already mentioned players being sold and not really being replaced and inconsistently. Or was there a time then, Steve, you started to feel have I made the wrong move here, or should I stay at Wolves? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you look at the, the the players I played with in the middle of the park at uh, Wolves. Remembering I, I, I'd been there for 10 years and these two guys that I played with at Wolves in the middle of the park, we we, well, we trained together, we played together, we socialised together and uh, and that was Kenny Hibbert and, and Willie Carr. And we, we just got this togetherness, you know, we'd do anything for each other. Um, we, we'd go through brick walls for each other and, uh, and, and we just had this, this great rapport with each other, you know. And the one season, um, Kenny scored 16 goals, I scored 14 and Willie was the, the midfield man that sat in the middle. Uh, he got 10, you know. So you're looking at 40 goals from the middle of your park, which is quite a lot, you know. Yeah. And then when I went to Manchester, it was sort of an experimental time. And I think Malcolm was looking for his, his best 11. And that, that took some time. And, um, it, it, you know, 
eventually. We, we, Malcolm, I love Malcolm. Malcolm was brilliant. He was, he was fantastic with me. And we went to Leeds. And I'll tell you what now, Mark. It was a Tuesday night. We absolutely battered him. We, we battered him from the first minute to the 90th. I think we had a goal disallowed. I think we the woodwork a couple of times. And I think they scored in the, within the last 20 seconds of the game to win 1-0. And sadly, the next day, Malcolm, Malcolm was, was, was sacked, which was... Um, I, I felt an incredible responsibility for that. And I, I, I couldn't... We were at Platte Lane, and I, I couldn't say ta to him. I couldn't... Because I was, I was close to tears. I couldn't say ta to him. And he phoned me uh, on that night and we had a really good chat and we were both, we, we were both in tears really. Um, and it was just a sad situation and I felt that I'd, I'd let him down and let the club down with, with the performances I gave because, it, I, you know, it, I always used to think that a footballer couldn't have a bad game. If you worked hard, you would, you would do some things good, but it seemed the harder I tried, the worse it become. You know, we played Tottenham on a Tuesday night at, at Main Road. And um, Paul Power's gone down the left wing. And he's crossed the ball. And I, I'm on the six-yard box. And right in the middle on the line of the six-yard box between me and the goal. The goal has committed himself at the near, near post. So it's come past him. And when it, when it got past him, it was coming to me. And I was panicking. When the ball was rolling to me, Matt, I was panicking in case I missed it. If that, if that would have been at Wolves at that time, I'd, I'd have put it in, I'd have put yeah, it in the sure, back of the No problem. But he took the bottom of my studs and just crawled over the line. And, and, and I thought, well, what are you doing, you know? And, and that, that's, that's how it got to me. And uh, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough. Looking back at the 79-80 season, you played it 36 times in total. What standout performance do you remember from that season, Steve, for you on a personal level, game-wise? Oh, right. Uh, I think we played at Bolton and uh, on a night game. I think it was a night, yeah, I think it was a night game and uh, we beat them 1-0 and I scored. And uh, it was great because the fans were cheering and chanting my name. Um, yeah, I would say that one for me. And, and the Leeds game when we got beat 1 0 in the last minute, that was another good game. But I'm, I've got to be honest with you, mate, I'm struggling to get any more <laughs> good games out of that. <laughs> Previous to what you were saying, I thought I couldn't have tied that in time and was awful, wasn't it? Well, the next question was about the Halifax Cup game, but I'll leave that one. <laughs> no, no, that, mate, that's fine. That's fine. You know, ask me what you want. Okay. So, 8081 see City featuring a fly on the wall Granada TV documentary, which was possibly the worst time for the club to do so with the poor rally results and Malcolm losing his job. What do you remember of that, Steve, of the filming of that? And how were the players with that at the time? I've got, I've still got the uh, CD of that. And I, I, watch, I watch that. I watch it and... Um, I look back and I think, man, you could have done better. You could have done, you could have done yourself a lot better by doing that, that, and that. Uh, and probably, I, I, you know, when when you you, you you take stick on a on a regular regular basis, because everywhere everywhere I went, all I ever got was what a waste of money. Yeah, you know, and um, and it, it was. It, it, yeah, it started. Things started to get to me. That, um, I was getting letters at my home telling me what people were going to do to me and my family. Um, it's crazy. I stopped, we said we had to stop the newspapers. Um, I was getting phone calls, um, and you don't. I, I was saying to my wife, I can, I can, I can cope with that. But on a regular, regular basis, then things happening to you in the press. I mean, I, I, I had some great mates in the press 
but some of the press that uh, was written about me, um, there was one there was one situation where someone at, at the club said uh, he's not fit to be a father. He doesn't treat his teammates uh, as they should. And you know, I'll tell you, you can ask Boothy, Mark, and you can ask Big Joe. I asked everybody if how I treated them. And they all said, great, brilliant, take no notice. But it, getting that advice of take no notice, it's it's very difficult, Mark, you know? I, I can't imagine, but it's, it's insane that people go to that, speak to that level, crazy. I tell you what, mate, all the letters I was getting telling me to leave, I was going to write to myself and tell myself to leave, you know? <laughs> yeah, would you have sent them? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John Bond comes in in October 1980 and you only feature three or four times more before leaving for the States. He made it yeah. clear that he wanted to move you on from starting coming in, Mr Bond? Well, um, John Bond and myself had had previous uh, at Molyneux. Um, his son Kevin was playing for Norwich. He was manager at Norwich and we had a little bit of a set to me and Kevin and he was going to he was gonna knock me out um, after the game and uh, as I'm going down the tunnel I look back and he's he's behind me and Richie Barker the assistant manager at Wolves came in and uh, parted it uh, he said that I got his son sent off which I don't think I did I think his son got himself sent off um, that's usually the way it works isn't it yeah <laughs> and <laughs> and um, he, he come to uh, he come to Main Road, and um, he come in the uh, the players' lounge. You've got everybody in the players' lounge, and he came in the players' lounge. And I'm I'm just leant against one of the windowsills with Joe Joe Colling and the keeper. And he he come in, Mark, and he never said good morning to anybody. He just come in and he said, um, "I don't bear grudges." He says, if I'd have got hold of him two or three years ago, I'd have killed him. And Big Joe said, is, is he talking to me? I said, no, Joe, he's talking to me. And I'm not being funny, mate. You being a goalkeeper, you should go and get your eyes checked. If you can't see who he's talking to. And uh, he was talking to me. And um, I knocked his door afterwards and I says, mate, I don't think I can play for you. And he said, well, there'll be some bad press. I says, where have you been for 12 months? <laughs> you know? And I think that was it. Um, he, he, I think, yeah, I think he, he, was, he was wanting to get me out uh, to recoup some, some of the, the one and a half million. Uh, and I, and in, in a couple of months after that, I was, I was heading for uh, America. Do you have any options to stay in England, Steve, or is it...? Yeah, uh, I had a few. Um, Chelsea were interested. I, I, I actually went down to Chelsea for talks. And uh, I had talks with a couple of other clubs. And um, I just thought, wherever I go, I, I, I get that, you know, what a waste of money and, and people chanting things and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, well... If I stay in England, that stigma is not going to go away. It's still going to be there. So I, I, I said to my wife, look, nothing will change. The only thing that will change is the club. Is me going from one club to another. And I don't think that what's happened to me in 15, 16 months at Main Road, that stigma will still be there and that, that will still happen. So I think we need a, a clean break. And I said, do you fancy going to America? She went, wherever you go, we'll go. And uh, we went out to Seattle for um, two and a half years. Um, came back to Burnley, funnily enough, for John Bond. Yeah, I was just thinking as you said that, it must be been... So Bond was the manager who signed you for Burnley? Yeah. Wow. He'd come over to uh, to America and I was at Seattle and we were playing uh, Tampa Bay. And I think we beat them 3-1. I scored one and made the other two. 
and after the game, he was in the, in one of the bars, and uh, he said, "Look, I'm I'm taking over at uh, Burnley. Do you want to come?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll come back." And uh, I, I I'd got an inkling that Seattle would 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 close. They they would go go under, and uh, I said, "Yeah, I'll come back." So we we the, the him and the chairman of Burnley came out to Seattle. Uh, Agreed everything and um, came back, signed a three year contract. Within 12 months, I'm back in America. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to go right into the whys and wherefores of, of, of that deal, Mark, but no, uh, it was difficult for me to stay. So how, um, how do you sum up your time at Man City, Steve? Um, I, it, it wasn't it wasn't the best of times in my career, um, and I, I I I did let I did let the the fans down. Which, like I say, it, it, I think about it every day, mate. Something will come in my mind that something will happen that will trigger something that would have happened at Main Road, um, and I, I just you know it's. I can't turn the clock back. I was, um, was going to ask you, so given the opportunity again, would you would you still sign for City if you go back in yeah. time? Yeah. You would? Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> I, I was on, to be honest, I was 20, I think I was 25 there when I went there. Um, and it, the, the, the actual fee, that there wasn't many people going for that sort of money, Mark, you know? Mm. Now, they're going every day. Yeah. And, and you're looking at 70, 80, 90 million, you know, over 100 million. And, and the time I was there, there was myself, Trevor Francis, and I think a lad that played for Coventry, Scottish striker. And um, yeah, it, it was few and far between. So if you didn't live up to, to, to the, that billing, people have got a right, every right to, to criticise. And uh, it was just difficult for me to, to, to turn it around. And the harder I tried, the worse it got, you know. But How's your relationship with the City fans now? Have you, have you been back to the club in any capacity? Yeah, I've, I've been up a few times to do Gary Owen's room, you know, the hospitality. And uh, I took my son with me, Ryan, and um, we pulled up to do the car parks at City, don't they? Uh, with, by colour. The yellow car park, the brown car park, the red one or whatever. And we're on this one, and, I, and I, we just put him into this car park, and I, uh, I said, God, I hope they don't recognise me, Ryan. Anyway, we, uh, we pulled up, and I said to the steward, I went, excuse me, mate. He went, hello, Steve, lovely to have you back, mate. And, I, <laughs> and uh, my son said, well, that's you done, Dad, isn't it? So, but yeah, they're, they're fantastic, you know, and, and I, I've done quite a number of dinners there. Uh, as I said to you, I did the one... Um, at the Etihad, I think there's about 400 fellas in, and I, I, I was nervous about doing it really. And um, they introduced me, and I didn't, I didn't know what sort of reception I was going to get, Mark, honestly. And I got a stand innovation, you know, and I couldn't believe it. And, and I, I said, I'll tell you what, if you'd have done that in 1979, things might have been a bit different, you know. And then I, I, start, I, stand, I stood up to do my speech and I went, I'll tell you what, I bet you never thought you'd have to pay to see me again. <laughs> and it, and they, honestly, mate, they were fantastic. And I've, I've been back up through, through um, sadly, he's no longer with us, Bernard, Bernard Halford, who was a, a really good friend of mine. Um, and I, I, I did a dinner there and um, it... it it was just, they, they, they were fantastic, you know. The, Colin Bell was there, uh, Franny Lee was there, Buzzer was there, Joel Boothy. And, it, it, mate, it, it was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it's nice to go back there and, 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 and get that response. Um, and people were saying, to, you know, whether, I, you know, they, they didn't recognise me or what, but they, if they recognised me, they, they made it known that, hey, Steve, how are you doing, mate? Nice to see you back. That's fantastic. Brilliant. Loved it. Loved the club. But like I said, the Kipax, fantastic. Great stuff.
So pandemic aside, what's Steve Daly of 2020 up to? Uh, we've, we, we, <laughs> we live in that village called Codsill, Mark, and we've, uh, we've got uh, three kids and 10 grandkids. And we all live within two miles of each other. So while everybody's going to work, me and my wife are taking the kids to school. And then at half past three, me and my wife are picking them up. And uh, I, yeah, just spending time with the family, you know? Not do, playing a bit of golf, playing a bit of golf. Not, not, not good golf, just trying to play a bit of golf. Keeps you fit. Steve, it does, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate your time and we wish you all the best, mate. Mark, thank you. An absolute pleasure. Thank you.